have his children's home offering is uh, is going this uh, this month. Uh, I guess today is the last day to do it, and we're a little bit short of our goal. So if you have not been able to give, there are uh, envelopes and offering plates and back there uh, if you can give. Uh, we're going to vote on the 22 budget next Sunday. If you need a copy, uh, see Ron. Uh, <laughs> I could have passed. I could have passed. I know. <laughs> so, like, there's, there's a point in our play that this is going to be tough and I'm good pants. Those are the play, no exactly what I'm talking uh, about. And you see, adult play practice will be uh, tomorrow at 6 30. And you see that the calendar's notepads are in, and I believe Ron said this morning she has extra. Uh, and we'll see men's prison pack list, uh, that project, which you can donate. Uh, anything else to come for us this time, or somebody want to elaborate on something that's been mentioned there? Yeah, the prison pack is together by Wednesday night, so if you want to bring something together, bring it here by Wednesday night, we'll put those together. All right. So yeah, well, I was about messed up here. So, if correct me if I'm wrong, Wednesday at 5 30, you know how many committee was going to meet? Okay. Uh, that's what I wrote down. So, Wednesday, 5 30, you know how many committee here at the church, you know, and uh, it was right before our Bible study at 7. Uh, anything else? <coughs> well, if there's nothing else, we'll go to our worship service. All right, good morning. We are uh, going to be in our hymn book this morning for our call to worship. So we'll turn to 223. Another blue blue on the bulletin for me. At 223, let's stand and sing all four verses.
portion of service where we're going to give it back uh, a portion of what God has blessed us with. Turn it unto uh, your work that your kingdom may become larger and larger. So, Father, we just thank you for all that you've done here at Shady Grove, for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Father. And, Lord, we give you all the thanks and the honor, for it's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Oh, in the 
Rock. Good morning. Good morning. Right. I think I'm going to marvel through this year. First thing I'm going to do is light a candle and then we'll go to the fire. God give you sight. Now I'm going to read scripture out of Isaiah verse two, chapter 2, verse 2 through 5. And now come to pass in the later day that the mountain of the Lord house shall be established on the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hill. And all the nations flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, he will teach us his way, and we shall walk in his life. For Zion shall go forth the law, just as it was the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He said, Judge between nations, and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up their sword against nations, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us pray. God of light, peace, a candle, place a candle in our heart so that we may walk as children of the light, treating gently on the path of peace and ever ready to welcome the signs of new life. Amen. 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 Uh, join together as we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. First and last verse.
uh, look over at the table of contents. <laughs> it's not a very popular book. It is a, uh, a book that is the conclusion of Jonah. And so, uh, if you need a few moments, we will be in the name book of David. Uh, I want to invite each and every one of you all to come out tonight at 7 o'clock and hear Brother Noah Hankins. He's uh, coming in. Uh, if y'all remember, he has filled in for me before. He's been going to college and been preaching up in Chicago and seen a lot of souls saved and uh, been in some, uh, I'm sure, hairy situations. And so God's using him, and I'm proud of him, and I'm, I'm going to have him come speak for us tonight. And uh, the Lord lays on your heart to uh, help him out a little bit. You bring something to help him out, okay? I'm just going to leave it at that. Uh, he's, he's got, I think, another year of school left, and he's out in Illinois, Wisconsin. I think the school is in Wisconsin, but he travels to Illinois over into Chicago to do his uh, mission work. So uh, uh, keep him in his prayers and come on out and hear him tonight. Uh, I'll give you a few minutes of, uh, to find Nahum. So <laughs> you've got Nahum. We're going to start in the first chapter there. If you can, if you will, if you're able, please stand and let's read God's word. In Nahum, starting in verse 2, he says, God is jealous, and the Lord avenges, and the Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and his reserve, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not acquit the wicked. The Lord has his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers, Bashan and Carmel wither, and the flower of Lebanon wilts. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt, and the earth heaves or burns at his presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. Verse 6, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Verse 7, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. I uh, thank you for just loving us and keeping us and for all your many blessings that you've bestowed upon each and every one. Lord, I thank you for just the opportunity to be in your house again. And Lord, I pray that you help me to preach as a dying man to dying people, Father, because that's what we are. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence. And we thank you for the opportunity to worship you. So Father, we give you all the honor and the glory. For all that you do, Father, I pray you open hearts, soften minds, Lord, and soften the hearts of the hard hearts of men, that they may be receptive to your word. And Lord, I thank you for all that you've done. For it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Nathan's book is, as I said, a sequel to the, uh, the dramatic uh, Jonah. And uh, so Jonah's mission to Nineveh was probably sometime in the first half of the 8th century. Uh, that was just shortly after Jerry graduated elementary school. <laughs> and to Jonah's dismay, <laughs> he, the Ninevites listened to his message. They repented. They said, okay, we believe you, man. And not just a few groups, but they repented from the king down. They all repented. They said, okay, we've seen how great your God is. We're going to repent. And so they did. And Jonah was a little upset. Because Jonah didn't like those folks. Y'all ever been around people you don't know about? I ain't preaching on that today, but y'all just give me a break. <laughs> but it did not last. It lasted only until about 745 BC, and then it became, that was about almost a little over a generation later, and then it became the leading military power in the ancient Near East. And the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel and became their fiercest enemy, and Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BC, making the end of the Assyrian Empire. Now, why did I say all that? Because I want you to understand that God does not have to deal in small portions. God can bring up empires, and God can bring down empires. 
God helped the Assyrian Empire stay up when they repented, and He brought them down when they fell into sin. Uh, I think sometimes we uh, get a little uh, Americanized with our view of who Jesus is and who God is. Our God is holy, and He is not one who is one to be mocked. He is not one to be taken lightly. The whole word, uh, I know y'all heard this growing up, uh, the, the blasphemy word. What does blasphemy mean? Blasphemy, uh, some, some may be sitting here thinking, well, I know what blasphemy is. It's when you say uh, the, the, the bad word. No, blasphemy in its utter meaning means to take lightly. Means to take lightly. What God says, when we take what He says lightly, or when we take it with just a grain of salt, or surely God didn't mean for us all to do that, but that's blasphemy of God's Word, is to take lightly. And so what I want to talk to you tonight about today, wow. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. I got my last final today, and I get a few weeks off. So, <laughs> uh, so I'm... I'm, I'm Trying to uh, get all that done. But anyway, the message I want to focus on today should be an encouragement. But here's what I want you to do before we get into the encouragement part. Is I want you to understand that all that descriptiveness that I went through, verses 2 through 6, is describing who God really is. Now some may think, well, you know, I, I've got this idea of, you know, Jesus being the, as I you know, heard me preach, the hippie Jesus. The one that hangs out and he's your friend and he's your buddy and he's your, he's your homie. But here I want you to understand that yes, God wants a relationship with his people, but God is holy. Leviticus 19.2 says, Be ye holy for I am holy. That's the Lord God talking to the people. He's saying he is holy, but now he's saying he's talking about his wrath. He's saying God is jealous. How many of you men, when you first started dating your wife, you were a little bit jealous? Anybody looked at your wife, you were ready to fight? How about you women? Anybody looked at your man, you was ready to fight? God is so jealous and God avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. Well, preacher, when you get to the encouragement part, <laughs> I want you to understand America, verse 3, is where we are in America. The Lord is slow to anger. <coughs> And great in power, and will not quit <coughs> the wicked. What is he saying? He's saying, no matter how much you may think, wow, God is wrathful, understand he's slow to anger. America has enjoyed years of blessings and bountiful blessings. Why? Because we have been a country based on. The principles of the Bible. Now we are everything almost but that. Amen. We have become a country that all but denies the very tenets of the Bible. We deny that the Ten Commandments still adhere to us. We deny that God was serious when He said stop sinning. We deny that it was even real. We have folks even today who deny the very existence of a creator. And as I've told you before, I am amazed, amazed at atheists. I'm amazed at their faith. I mean, you think about their faith, how much faith it takes to go outside and say, nothing started this. Nothing made this. This all just became and it just was it and it was just here and it took billions and billions and billions of years but somehow we stopped evolving but we're still evolving but we're no longer evolving. We don't really know. We just want to explain it away any other way than Genesis 1-1. 
So we have, we live in a world where they deny the very tenets and truth of God. But here's the good news. With all these ideas that we have about God, and by the way, I, I, I'm, I'm drawn to verse 5 where it says, The mountains quake before him and the hills melt and the earth heaves. They burn in his presence and yet the world and all those who dwell in it. Listen, for those who are an enemy of God, those who have denied his son, those who are, are trying to hopefully make it on their good works or their good looks or their good deeds, I want you to understand one day you are going to stand before the one who the very hills melt before and, you know, I've heard a lot of people in my time, I would say, well, when I get before the Lord, I'm going to, let me tell you something, you're not going to say a word. My Bible says the only thing you're able to utter is that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when I hear these guys come up and say, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to say to him. I know exactly what you're going to say. You're going to confess him to the Lord. The only difference is you're going to confess him too late. And he's going to look at you and say, yes, I am, Lord. But you, you depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. I never had a relationship with you. So who can stand his anger? Who can endure his fierceness? I love verse 7. Verse 7, if you'll allow me just a few minutes, I'm going to preach out of verse 7. The first thing we see is God is good. For as the heaven is high above earth, so great is his mercy. Steadfast love and goodness toward them that fear him. God is good. Now how in the world, after I said all those things, can I say God is good? Because I'm under the blood. I'm one of his. I have pronounced him Lord of my life and given him everything over to him. Why? Because he is God. And he is good. And he deserves all my honor and all my respect and all everything I am. So I can say that God is good. You know, back in the day, I don't know if they did, maybe this might be a mountain thing, I don't know. But it used to, you'd say God is good. And all the time. Well, some of y'all got there. God is good. And all the time. And He is. In the gift and grace of salvation, you can say, Amen. If all that you have is salvation, you can say, Amen. Because that's all that's going to matter in the end is that you know He's yours and you're His. Uh, the blessings of living in a free country. The blessings of being a part of this church. The blessings of having a free choice in our lives so that we can come to church and we can make those decisions. God is good. Satan tries to cripple our witness and productivity in the work of God by attempting to get us to doubt God's goodness. How often do we stop from our busy schedules and take time to just praise God for His goodness? I heard a preacher preaching this morning. He said that uh, he was preaching on praise. And he said the average person takes 28,000 breaths in a day. Did y'all know that? Before you know. <laughs> I thought it was interesting. Out of those 28,000, Breaths. How many of those breaths do we spend grumbling and complaining and, 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 and wishing this and wishing that? I'm reminded of the children of Israel. Every time God would provide and they'd say, Oh, praise the Lord. Every time things would get hard, they'd say, I wish we'd have just stayed in Egypt, man. Now, some of us might think that's crazy, but you think about this. These people are free. God is feeding them. God is clothing them. God is protecting them. And they said, man, I wish we'd have just stayed in slavery. Now y'all think, I would never do that. But how many times as a Christian do we have God's salvation and we know we're saved that we complain because God has provided what we thought we should have. I'll start us off. 
guilty. I'm guilty of saying, well, God, look at what all I do. Don't you think I should? Don't you think I ought to have this? Well, Lord, I just don't understand it. If things are going this bad, I mean, what in the world? I'm still saved. I'm still his. Ain't nothing changed that. But God is good. Amen. Next thing we see is a stronghold in the day of trouble. I found this little story. I thought that I just found it just amusing. But this little boy was talking to his grandmother about how bad of a day he had had. And how things just were not working out for him. I mean, it was one of them days, Debbie. You know, you just had one of them days. <laughs> but the grandma looked at the little boy and said, How about a snack? We said, Well, yeah, I'd like a snack. A snack would be great. That would make me feel better. And she said, Okay, here's some flour. I said, I don't want flour. He said, Well, I'm sorry. Here's two raw eggs. I said, I don't want two raw eggs. She said, here's some baking soda. She said, I don't want baking soda. I wanted a snack. She said, listen, you need to understand that even though you might not understand why things are going the way they are in your life, God is working them out in the bigger plan. Now, you might be experiencing flour, but know that somebody else is the egg, somebody else is the, the baking soda. And you know what? When you put it all together, it's a cookie. Now some of y'all are thinking, how in the world do I get there? Understand that life may not go the way you think it is, but you are a part of this plan. You may be just the part you might not want to be, but you are a part of this plan. And understand that. And thank God for being a part of this plan. I thought that story was really cute. I didn't say it was good as they did on the thing. But, but when you put everything together, you have a delicious cake. I left myself a little bit. <laughs> Hebrews 13, 5 says, God will never leave us nor forsake us. He is our stronghold in the day of trouble. We are struggling in our days as we look around and I see the world and what it's becoming. I was, I was talking with a, a family member and uh, they were discussing something funny that Hudson had done in his past. Uh, well, I don't think he'd be too mad at me for telling the story. But I guess he'll tell me about it later. But when he was younger, we were in Bell, Stacy and him were in Bell walking around. I wasn't there, so I can't be blamed for the parenting. <laughs> <laughs> but this lady came up to my wife and began to talk to her and was discussing something that was on sale or something. And Hudson kept interjecting, hey, 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 hey. Finally, the lady took her attention off my wife and said, yes. And he looked at her and said, are you a girl or a boy? <laughs> she was an older woman and she, I guess, smoked for many years and had to go after. And so my son says, Are you a girl or a boy? <laughs> and so the lady went on and assumed, pretended like she didn't hear what he said, and she went back to talking to my wife and he said, Hey! Hey! <laughs> so she went back at him and she says, Yes, a little. Are you a boy or a girl? <laughs> and so the family member, she said uh, she said this, and she didn't know that she was going to react to get this response, but she said, he was just really uh, just preparing for the time to come. I said, you know, this day and time where we have people who are confused about whether they are boys or girls, I said, that's very true. She said, he was just prepared for this day and age. I said, that's sad. That's sad. That instead of, of worrying about all the things in the world we have to worry about, 
We have people who are going around and they don't understand whether they're a boy or a girl. These are days of trouble because we are slowly becoming the people they are turning against. We teach that God made male and female. The world teaches that if you wake up and want to feel like a frog with purple hair, you can be a frog with purple hair. If you wake up and feel like you want to be a, a whatever, you can be that. Folks, we live in a day and time where truth is no longer absolute to the world. And we have universities that are teaching our children that truth does not exist. There is a, a, a college right now out west that is battling against the new housing administration from the current administration. They put extra things on to make sure that even the Christian universities do not discriminate against those who are transgender. So now at a Christian university, this isn't a public university I'm talking about. This is a Christian university that I'm talking about. The administration said you will allow men in your women's locker room or we'll shut you down. You will allow men who identify as women into your girls' dorms. You will allow them into the showers. You will allow them into the bathrooms. Folks, this is the day and time that we are living in. We are living in a day and time where the father of confusion is not God, but is Satan. And he has swept this nation, causing us to become so divisive and so confused that we don't know where to look. And everybody's saying, look anywhere but the church. We're in a day of trouble. But I'm glad that God is my stronghold in the day of trouble. The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows. He knows those who trust in Him. He knows our every weakness and He still loves us. He knows how many of y'all were arguing with each other before you walked in the door. He knows you all. He knows every single person. He knows what you're suffering in silence with. He knows what you struggle with. He knows what makes you happy. And He knows how sinful we can become. And you know what? He still loves us. And what amazes me is that God knows everything about me and, he, and the fact that He knows everything about me and He still loves me is what amazes me. You got a three-point sermon out there. God is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And He knows you. What does that mean to know? It means He has a relationship with you. It means whenever you pray and God hears you, He knows what you really need. God, I need a brand new BMW. Nope, you need a 2012 Honda Civic. <laughs> God, I need a Range Rover. Nope, you need a Honda Odyssey. <laughs> God, I need out of this debt. No, you need to know what it is to pay off debt so you quit getting in. Ooh. <laughs> but some of y'all didn't know I was going to come out with that, did you? <laughs> Nobody did that. Say out to him again. He knows our strengths and still wants us. He knows that you're weak. He knows that we fail. And he still wants us. There's a story of a man who was possessed with devils over in the De Decapolis over toward Gessenia. 
I'm telling the Bible story. <laughs> well, no, it's not down past liberty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he was possessed with many demons. It's just south of climax down here. <laughs> but he was possessed with many demons, and everybody in the community knew that he was wicked and knew he was horrible. He would sit in the graveyard and cut himself just to watch himself bleed. He, they would come in there and they would chain him because not only would he try to hurt himself, but he would try to hurt others and he would break the chains that they tied him down. This man was crazy. He was possessed. He was not wanted. Nobody wanted to be near him. Nobody wanted to even look at him. And Jesus went by his way. Why? Why? Because God knew the worst of him and loved him anyway. And so God by went by this man's way. He cast out the demons. And whenever the people saw him, they were in awe that God would know someone and still save them. Amen. Somebody needed to hear that. God knows you and still offers salvation to you. Look at it. Look at it. He says He knows those who trust Him. He knows. And He knew the demonic man who was possessed knew all that He had done all the people that he had hurt, all the sins he had committed, all the bad deeds he had done, all the curse words he had said, and still went by his way. What in the world makes you think he won't come by yours? All these Encouragement, the Lord is good, He's our stronghold, and He knows us are all great things for a Christian to know. But I want you to understand something. If you're outside, if you're outside the relationship of that with Christ, you do not have these promises to cling to. You do not have this verse to look forward to. Outside of a relationship with Christ, I will tell you what you have to look forward to. The Lord has His way and in the whirlwind and the storm and the clouds and the dust of His feet, dust of his feet the mountains quake before Him and the hills melt. The earth burns in His presence. Yes, the world and all who dwell in it. You have the wrath of God to look forward to. And I don't mean him getting mad and smacking him on the list. I'm talking about the same God that the hills just melted before. The same God that the clouds are but the dust of his feet. The outside of Christ, we have the wrath of God to deal with. See, those that are saved were part of an exchange. That exchange looked a lot like this. How many of y'all ever shot a bow? Not shot a bow, don't shoot a bow. But how many of y'all ever shot a bow? <laughs> y'all ever shot a bow? The wrath of God is like a bow. My friends, it is pointed. His hand is drawn back and it is pointed at every single one of you. Every single one of us has that bow pointed at him. The wrath of God is due to you. If anybody needs any help explaining that, I can go any further. But we are all sinners, and we're all due God's wrath. And so, in consideration of knowing that God's wrath is pointed at every single one of us, there's only one way out. That's in John 14, 6. I bet y'all can probably quote that. When I say that, it's much. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Unless you repent and believe on the name of Jesus Christ, 
that bow or that arrow of wrath will come upon you. So what's the difference between me and someone outside? Is that the wrath had to be poured out. And whenever he poured his wrath out for his own, he poured them out on his son. And so as he poured it out on his son, if you accept his salvation, God releases his wrath upon his son in my place. Outside of Christ, I have wrath ready to be poured out on me. But whenever I accepted Jesus Christ, He took the wrath. He took the punishment. He took the beating. He took the scourging. He took the mockery. He took everything that I deserved. He took the cross that I deserved. He took the sacrifice that I deserved. I deserved all of the things that happened to Jesus. But instead, he stepped into my place and he took all that from me. And if you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're his, he took that for you. See, as a Christian, we have a lot more to praise God about than to complain about. When we start thinking about the big picture, and start thinking about the wrath that's not coming upon us. I'm reminded every day that God didn't have to save me. God didn't have to come by my way. But I'm certainly glad He did. Because without Him, I would be lost, dying, and on my way to hell. I wonder today with each person gathered here. Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're His? I didn't ask are you a member of the church. I didn't ask if you're a deacon. I didn't ask if you're a preacher. I didn't ask if you were the, the son or daughter of anything. I said do you have a personal relationship with God? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that today was the last day that you would be in the presence of God. And he would be saying the words come in. Or would you be hearing the words? Depart from me. You work with everybody. I never knew you. This is a question that only you can answer. As Christians. We need to rejoice that we have victory in Jesus and that, that God's already taken the punishment for us. He's taken the wrath for us. He's taken our place. But if you're here today and you don't know beyond a shadow of a doubt, can I beg with you for just a moment and plead with you? Don't take a chance of never having an opportunity again. Don't take a chance that you'll do it later and never get it. Submit to Him today. Make Him Lord of your life. And know that even though you might think you know what kind of life you need or the life that you deserve, know that He knows you. I would rather know that he knows me and he send me off to Zimbabwe than me be in a church of 10,000 and be lost. Can a preacher be lost? Absolutely. Can a deacon be lost? Absolutely. Can a member of the church be lost? Absolutely. It's about that personal relationship you have between you and God. How's your relationship? Is God good? Is He your stronghold? And does He know you? Does He know you? Father God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for your love and your kindness and your mercy. 
Lord, I don't know who all may be here that you may be dealing with today. But Father, I pray that you remove any obstacle that may stand in the way. Lord, I pray you help them to come down to this old-fashioned altar and make that relationship with you a real thing. Father, as I drove home last night, my mind was taken as I drove by a three-car piled up red mess. Father, the thought in my head was maybe there might have been somebody in one of those cars that thought, I'll get saved later. And later never came. And Father, they opened their eyes up in hell. Father, I know that hell is a reality. And I know that you wish no one to go there. Father, help us Christians to rejoice in our salvation, knowing that you paid the price for us. And Lord, burden us, burden us so heavy with those who do not have a relationship with you. Father, help us to wake up every morning knowing that God is good. You are our stronghold. And you know us. Father, I give you all the honor and glory. Father, I thank you. And I ask that you just touch the hearts and lives of the people today, Lord. For it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. As you notice today, I, I want to pose this question to you.